Okay, so good to have everybody here. Um, we are ready to get started. Okay, so I'm going to start screen sharing. Very good. Okay. Lovely, lovely, lovely. All right, everybody. Thank you again. Um, all corners of the world tuning in here today uh, for this wonderful open lecture. Uh, quick introduction. I am Joe Gabriel working with XR Bootcamp. Amazing team here. And today, uh, something special ready for, for everybody here. This is the behind the scenes with Ultra Leap, lessons learned around development and intera interaction design. Uh, in previous open lectures, uh, XR Bootcamp, we've put on a couple different lectures with Magic Leap together with Microsoft to talk about uh, their MRTK and HoloLens 2. And today, uh, we're very, very grateful for Chris, Hannah, and John to be on with us to give a little more of a deep dive uh, into some of the specific use cases and technical aspects of UltraLeap, their dev tools, and how you, the developers and designers here, can get started on that platform and some great tips and tricks along the way. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping here before we get started. So uh, here at XR Bootcamp, um, we, we do a few things. So one of the great things that we get to do with developers is put on this eight-week um, master class. And this is an advanced Unity uh, development training course. Uh, and, and I want to introduce this to you just a little bit. So um, the hand tracking interaction design class, we get professional developers, indie de developers, we get um, people looking to work on client projects, side projects, personal projects, uh, folks from these different companies join our master class to upskill to become very proficient in advanced Unity interaction design. Uh, what I really like about this course uh, is how well it's able to get you, A, upskilled in Unity, uh, specifically for advanced interaction design, as well as help you network together with the mentors, with the lead instructors, and they're going to get to share some more uh, today as well. Um, and what I really like about this, so for me, I'm kind of like a designer that's trying to learn development myself, just for my own side projects. Uh, I use YouTube a lot, and sometimes I use some other like side resources, but uh, it's, it's really challenging for me diving into this type of curriculum because it's not structured in a way that helps me kind of graduate my learning, uh, where the master class really excels and kind of succeeds in this and helps developers succeed is uh, the type of curriculum design here to help you, the designer and developer, really take your skills you know, from here to here. Uh, the curriculum, uh, and we're, we're not going to kind of hedge around this, it is very challenging curriculum. Um, however, uh, the way that it's been designed is it's very, very accessible for beginner, intermediate, and advanced developers to be able to kind of tailor it to their skill set, to the level of depth that they're ready to go, and the level of nuance that they want to put into it. Um, uh, just uh, to go over the curriculum, just a real quick kind of introduction. On the call, we do have uh, Dennis and Roger. They are the lead instructors, uh, co-founders of Holonautic, and also the team behind the Hand Physics Lab. Uh, Dennis and Roger, uh, if you're able to jump on real quick and just give a quick kind of two minutes uh, from the lead instructor perspective, a um, little insight on, on the curriculum. Uh, yes, can you, can you see us and hear us? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let me stop my screen sharing real quick. Oh, we can't see any video. Very good. OK. Um, yeah, I mean, we designed an eight, week, eight weeks class where we start uh, like really from the ground up, where you first learn how to set up Unity with uh, the hand tracking, et cetera, um, that everything starts well. And then we go through multiple types of interactions, starting with locomotion to then kinematic UI interfaces and interacting with the world to towards the end. Then, more physics-based interactions as well as inverse kinematics to make a uh, robotic arm come alive and that you can interact with him and play with him uh, while you work in that lab. Yeah, the, the goal of that class is not only to like uh, play around with hand tracking, it's really to have like a deep mindset on how you can build VR apps in general from the ground up, like build a locomotion system, really think how can you build interaction system for uh, controllers and hand tracking and really see how, how, what the challenges are, how you can like solve a problem in different ways, how you can build different interaction system, either using mm -hmm. physics or purely kinematically using like a holographic UI. And yeah, over those eight weeks, we really try to like uh, tackle all those different challenges. We start quite simple and then or along the weeks it gets like harder and you explore really deep how you can do all that. Yeah. Stuff. 
for uh, for anyone that's calling in from like an agency or a production studio or uh, companies that are just like working with clients, you know, specifically around interaction design that might be using some of these principles, how might Masterclass kind of help, you know, groups like that? Um, it depends, of course, uh, of what kind of approach you have in mind, but we focus here on mm -hmm. hand interactions and the most common problem is like just the hands are already amazing, uh, which we will probably hear more about, like how amazing it is to have hands inside an application, but then how you interact with the world and make it feel seamless, that it's uh, intuitive and feels like part that you feel like part of the world and not just like something attached to it, like a ghost. So we basically go through all of that and show uh, in, we also like from the code design perspective, we try to do a modular system where you can easily extend it afterwards further to adapt it to your own needs. And so we go through also a lot of good coding practices of how to build uh, such an interactive framework that you can afterwards easily extend it and improve upon it uh, based on your needs. Yeah, that's great. Because every project really is super unique and the clients have those specific kind of uh, requirements. So yeah, having that extensible framework, super helpful. Um, real quick, uh, everybody listening, if you didn't see, Webinar 10 is just a quick promo code for uh, for the masterclass for anyone that's here to go check out on xrbootcamp.com. Um, and so Roger and Dennis, you have some interesting news uh, that everyone here is kind of like able to listen to for the first time, right? So yes, uh, it has been a long time. People have been asking for it for quite like a few months after all the hints that were shown in the video on the social media. But yeah, finally, the big update for Hand Physics Lab is coming uh, next week. Uh, and there will be a private beta access starting tomorrow uh, for selected members. Um, and yeah, we are really happy to see and get feedback from the community on that new update. Very good. OK, I got the YouTube video right here. I'm going to key this up and um, yeah. Everyone, like any questions, whatever you have, please, uh, there is at the bottom of the Zoom link, there is a Q&A specifically, and then there's chat. Make sure to put the questions in the Q&A so they don't uh, get overlooked, okay? And so I'm gonna give you, a, uh, we're gonna go over to this YouTube video that Dennis and Roger prepared on this new Hand Physics Lab update, the Get a Grip update. All right, here we go. All right. I think there is no sound. Oh, no. I'm so sorry, guys. It's because I'm using my uh, my external mic right now. Shoot. Um, I tell you what, let's put the YouTube link real quick into the chat. Um, I can do this real quick. And in like 60 seconds, 60 seconds, what is like? What is the video showing specifically about the update? And those who might not be very familiar with like what the previous version was and why this is a significant step up. So yeah, one of the main feedback um, I got from the community was that uh, grabbing object was sometimes difficult, especially when you were trying to grab a tool or like something you really needed to have a strong grip on it to be able to interact with. That's why in that update, it really focuses on really trying to have some predictive poses that when you try to approach an, an object and you want to grab it firmly, it will guess what you're going to do and really like snap that object strongly to your hand. Uh, no matter if it's a, like a tool, like a hammer, like a crowbar or a pencil, it will really try to find the ideal pose that you can grab that object and use it in the, in the most intuitive way that it feels good and that it's not like that you have a hard time trying to grab something and use it. Yeah, like as we discussed, like in the previous webinar, like there were like the Half-Life Alex style of uh, predictive grabbing systems and HPL had more like a purely physics-based grabbing. We tried to merge the two together to get something in between where you still keep the physics-based aspect, but have more predictive grabbing to help with smaller and more fine-grained objects to interact with. Okay, I'm gonna try the video one more time. I just tried uh, switching up my audio settings. Please let me know if this is working, okay? We're gonna try one more time. We got audio? Uh, no. Is there audio still? Uh, well, we can hear you, but nothing else. Nothing from the video? Shoot, okay. Well, we have the links. Uh, 
we have the link set up here and we're ready to start the lecture. Um, thanks so much, Dennis and Roger. Um, we're gonna get started with UltraLeap. Please, everyone check out that video for the update around hand physics lab. Uh, and uh, we mentioned that the, when will everyone have access to it? Access to the build on SciQuest coming next Friday. Yes. Like not the Friday coming this week, the one in a week from now. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. All right. Well, excited to mess around and, you know, try not to feel too much as you're lopping them off with lasers and bending your bones and, and working too hard on that, right? All right. Great. Thanks so much, Dennis and Roger. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. So do we have uh, our Ultra Leap speakers ready to rock and roll? Let's make sure we've got yes, the audio. Sir. Nice. Okay, cool. Um, Great. And we got Hannah on board as well and Chris. Very nice. And you got your presentation ready. Okay, cool. Um, so just a quick... Uh, uh, last week, we had a great kind of one-on-one -on -one chat together with uh, UltraLeap CTO and co-founder Tom Carter, and he's able to kind of give kind of like a nice kind of overview of what uh, UltraLeap does, what some of the hardware is, how it's kind of positioned against other uh, existing um, hand tracking uh, capabilities on other types of headsets. And so today is really nice because we're going to get a little more of a technical deep dive into use cases and design perspectives. Uh, and so really, thank you all for jumping on here. Um, yeah, so Farhan and I will be kind of doing some light moderation, but you really kind of have the show and you have your slides already prepped. So uh, take it away. All right, thank you, Joe. Uh, so just for context, this is a presentation on advanced hand interactions. So we assume that you know, the basics are something that you can get from our uh, examples. Uh, you can get from uh, the XR Bootcamp uh, here we're going to be talking about a few more uh, advanced, perhaps, uh, prototype concepts that uh, sort of push the boundaries of what's possible with hand tracking. Uh, so, let me know. Oh, by the way, is the, uh, are the Zoom, uh, the Zoom HUD elements uh, interfering with the presentation? Doesn't look like it. Okay, anyways. Uh, so the first... No, they're good. Yeah, they're good. Great, awesome. So the agenda today uh, is first going to be a presentation uh, for me on interactions at a distance, or the kinematics of intuitive telekinesis. Uh, given that you know, most of the VR space uh, and hand tracking space has been focused on nearby interactions, uh, I'm gonna show you a few um, tricks and tips today for interacting at a, at a distance outside of your kind of personal space. Uh, so, uh, just to get started, and for context, uh, my name is Jonathan Selstad. I've been working in VR for seven years or so. Uh, I've been working at uh, Leap Motion slash Ultra Leap for the last four and a half years. Um, I'm a principal software engineer, and uh, I've worked on projects ranging from uh, Product North Star uh, to heuristic and physical algorithms of the interaction engine, and sort of everything in between. Uh, and in that time, we've solved a lot of problems around the usability and robustness of hand tracking. We built systems that enable you to pick up, stack, and throw virtual objects as if they were really there while gracefully handling physically implausible situations. We've pioneered novel techniques for building user interfaces entirely for midair uh, touch and released dozens of examples, applications to help developers build their unique vision for VR and AR. Let's see, great. Oftentimes, we've found more than one way to do something. For example, when exploring this Menger sponge, which is a type of 3D fractal, we found it can be equally effective to move the sponge as seen in the top GIF or to move the user while leaving the sponge stationary as seen in the bottom GIF. This simple pinch to zoom method of locomotion works well when the user needs to interact with something that is uh, nearby. However, uh, when the object is far away, uh, users must change their size to cover that distance quickly before shrinking again to directly interact with their object. And this multi-step uh, motion is cumbersome and ineffective. It's not really the best way to get to something that's far away. Uh, and while you can use uh, techniques like uh, trajectory locomotion and uh, parabolic, um, yeah, parabolic trajectory uh, locomotion, um, we're going to investigate some techniques for interacting with objects that are uh, 
far away without covering the intermediate, intervening distance. And so really the problem is that you want to hold the world in the palm of your hand, but it's too far away. So the first time I encountered this problem, my instinct was to cast a ray from the eyes through my pinching fingers to select and modify far away objects. And hopefully the uh, frame rate on these GIFs isn't too low. Uh, however, testing showed us that this didn't work well. Users complained that their arms were getting tired from holding them up so high or that they couldn't see what they were trying to select, or that the selector moved off of their target right before they hit it, and that their two hands selectors couldn't cross and converge uh, like their hands could in real life. And that last complaint led to an epiphany. Why can't the left and right cursors cross and converge in this system while my hands can in real life? Well, it's because your arms are not attached to your eyes. I mean, of course your arms aren't attached to your eyes, but then why am I ray casting from the eyes as if they're the origin of my arm's coordinate system? I should really be ray casting from the shoulders. Ray casting from the shoulders allows one to lower their hands while freeing up their field of view to see their target. And since they're not aiming via the perspective pinching position, we can ray cast with hand bones that remain stable throughout the pinch. And of course, the left and right shoulder rays can freely cross and converge since your shoulders are laterally separated from each other, uh, thus allowing the rays to kind of cross in front of you. And this leads to the first useful distance interaction pattern. Uh, the laser pointer. The laser pointer affords users precise pointing and selection over very large distances. This mimics the VR controller based laser pointing paradigm without requiring an IMU on the hand. But as a bonus, users can trade precision for ergonomic comfort by moving their hands closer to their shoulder. And likewise, they can gain extra precision by holding their arms out. For example, here you can see the dexterity and stability of the laser pointer cursor against a faraway menu in the Leap Motion UI input module which I built in 2016 to demonstrate hand tracking optimized menu interactions in VR. Again, hopefully the frame rate isn't uh, too low for you to see what's going on here. Uh, and then uh, on this screen, I show the uh, accuracy of the laser pointer in a first person shooter context. Uh, and so this demonstrates that the shoulder projection laser pointer is a viable alternative or competitor to both mice and VR controllers in terms of precision, accuracy, and speed. All right, let's see. But the question might be, you know, what if you just want to select things? What if uh, you don't need that accuracy? Uh, well, there's an easy solution to that. Um, simply expand your ray cast into a cone cast. This flashlight pointer lets your users be sloppier about where they're aiming while still providing strong expressivity and selectivity. And cone casts are still physics engine friendly, uh, you just use a sequence of sphere casts to approximate a cone. Martin and Barrett demonstrated the flashlight pointer paradigm in their 2018 Road to VR blog post, Summoning and Superpowers. And so you can see they have their sticky selection and uh, the shoulder ray casts that allow them to uh, easily select objects that are you know, meters and meters away. And if you squint, you might even be able to, uh, you might feel like you've seen this interaction in a popular VR title before. Uh, that is, if you've seen Half-Life Alex, which first published its usage of the flashlight pointer as gravity gloves at the end of 2019. And so you might be wondering, uh, is there an even better choice than flashlight pointers? And the answer is actually not really. The flashlight pointer is almost the best, always the best option for distance selection when your use case allows for it. But there is another choice. When you need to manipulate the position of an object in 3D space, then you might want to consider extending your reach. Projected hands are simply the result of scaling your hands relative to your shoulders. Due to the extra depth degree of freedom, uh, they're more cumbersome than laser pointers or flashlight pointers for selection but they're quite handy for placement and spatial manipulation. Uh, as an example, I first explored projected hands in the, uh, as an Easter egg in the 2016 UI input module. Uh, the extras folder included this scene, which awakens the user's latent telekinetic powers to stack large boxes from a distance. All right, hopefully we're gonna be sharing this presentation afterwards so that you'll be able to see all of these GIFs and videos at full frame rate. For a more recent example, 
Microsoft published an updated MRTK build containing hand rays, which effectively hybridized the flashlight pointer and the projected hands paradigm to enable manipulation of 3D holograms in your environment. So essentially what's going on here is that they're casting a ray from essentially a shoulder or shorter like position and wherever that ray hits becomes the, uh, sets the scale for the projected hands uh, or the projected uh, hand position, which allows you to manipulate those objects without actually having to navigate to that depth uh, you know, with your hand prior to the interaction. Uh, the ray cast initializes the projected hand depth. Projected hands can also gracefully transition to pointers upon contact with surfaces. In AR, I expect a hybrid tool like this to be the primary way that you place props, mark waypoints, paint your environment, and generally interact with the scanned, reconstructed world around you. In conclusion, your hands are attached to your shoulders, and they're the true basis, coordinate space, for hand interactions. Uh, two, shoulder-based laser pointers are a quick drop-in technique to replace IMU-based controller pointers. Three, Flashlight pointers are even better for selecting objects, especially from a cluttered scene. Four, projected hands are primarily useful for spatial manipulation and placement. Don't use them for selection. Uh, your user doesn't want to have to juggle that, that depth uh, uh, manipulation uh, for selection. Uh, and lastly, you know, uh, projecting from your eyes looks silly, so don't do it. That ends my portion of the presentation. With that, I pass the floor over to Chris Wren. That was great, John. Thanks for sharing. Uh, quick, just for everybody uh, presenting, uh, in, folks in the, in the chat are saying that frame rate looks good, videos are looking good, nice and smooth on their side. Um, and then I'm also, uh, some of you are asking where uh, this presentation will be, like where can they find a link for it afterwards? Uh, so I'm gonna put a link in the chat to uh, the XR Creators Discord server. Um, that's where we put all of our presentations afterwards. Um, and so please just feel free to come join us over there. A lot of great devs, uh, researchers, students, um, all kind of troubleshooting and talking about these kind of really cool topics. So thanks, John. Thank you. Hey guys, uh, sorry about the delay. I had to find my mute button. Welcome to Zoom. Uh, thank you, John. <laughs> John, I was like, listening to pretty much everything John has to say about hands. He's kind of an oracle. Um, what chance I had to listen to him. This, and because of COVID, we haven't had a lot of chance to kind of integrate. So it's really cool to see uh, what he's been up to. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Uh, my name is Chris Wren. I come from a long time ago, background in video game development, but more recently, uh, the last five or so years, I've been in VR. I uh, started my own VR company a while back, uh, about actually about six years ago, and then uh, joined Ultra Leap back then, Ultra Haptics, and more than half the side of the business uh, about three and a half years ago. Um, and I was tasked with kind of putting together prototypes to show off how do we best use hand tracking and haptics um, and showcase just the multimodal interaction, immersive space, and um, VR being my background, I spent a lot of time in VR, um, trying to develop prototypes in VR. And so uh, John's showing a lot of superpowers and, and some of the amazing kind of distance um, interactions you can, you can make. I'm gonna focus, I think, just a little bit more on object interactions and uh, near field interactions um, and natural. And natural is really kind of the key to it all. Um, a lot of ground to cover, so I'm gonna go kind of slow at the beginning, but then uh, get, I have a, a fair number of demos I want to show everyone. So um, let me just quickly kind of give you the history of the world. And I'll go quickly. Uh, so when we think about hands, um, it's pretty amazing when we think about these tools that we've had since you know we were born. Uh, they help us get around. They help us you know, feed ourselves, communicate, interact. Um, and through the course of human history, we've developed all sorts of tools and wonderful things to kind of um, be more efficient uh, interact better, um, and that led us up to computers, keyboards. You look at the keyboard in front of you, a lot of you are in front of computers right now, you're looking at a QWERTY keyboard. It's a 150-year-old keyboard. Um, the layout's almost identical to what it was 150 years ago, um, and we still use it. Uh, and as we've gotten into 
you know, the last 30 or 40 years, we started developing some more interface <clears throat> devices. We've seen things from like the Nintendo Power Glove, the mouse, obviously, um, with the advent of in this demonstration, what are all demos uh, coming out of Stanford. Um, and then we really, the technology is all kind of synthesized more recently, just in the last decade, to kind of give us computer vision, to give us um, neural networks and, and machine learning and things that let us recognize hands in the digital world. And so without devices, without any kind of extra peripheral, um, just a camera or sensor that can see these hands, we can now use them as the tools that we had way back when. So there's, there's a cyclical full circle um, element to this that um, UltraLeap really is at, at the center point of and has really pioneered uh, what's possible with hand tracking. Um, and we've had so many great examples uh, throughout the industry to, to showcase what's possible, but it really is, I think, the there's a strong mentality about this is the tool that we want to use. And I think UltraLeap is really trying to figure out how best to use that. Um, and as it developed, we, we had quite a few, you know, standards that, are, that are get developed. And some of those are de facto. Um, they just are the easiest way to do something. Sometimes they're, um, they're a massive efficiency. Sometimes they're just what was presented and the only thing that was presented and therefore they became a standard. But for whatever reason, all of those exist in our mentality and we have to as we design we have to think a little bit about what came before and what are the preconceptions that exist in the mind of the users of our technology and software and so we bear that in mind um, and what we've done is we you know you've seen some there's a lot of gesturing you'll see quite a bit of gesturing work in the hand space um, more often than not when i'm doing vr development i end up falling back on some of the more um, natural interactions. How would you hold that object normally? How would you touch that, that interface or that control mechanism naturally with your hand if it was a physical element? And so whenever possible, I generally tend to lean back on the natural interactions just because there's a learning curve uh, that you get to minimize because of that. Um, but you want to take into account some of these efficiencies that have happened over the years and that, that we can assume some of our users uh, have come to bear on. So some of those are helpful and some of those we have to kind of un, unteach um, because uh, they're counterproductive to this new medium, this new way of interacting with our hands. Um, the first one I'm showing you here is a, this is the demo that actually got me hooked on back then Ultra Haptics, now Ultra Leap. Um, I showed up at the trade show, I was talking about VR and hands and other things and, and I, in my spare time, I was walking around doing demos, and there's this booth called Ultra Haptics that I went to, and they showed me this demo, and it was it was essentially just a cube and a ball that you played around with, and if you don't know our technology outside of hand tracking, we also have a phased array of transducers that create ultrasound pressure on your hand that you can feel, um, and we have a lot of control over that, and we can actually create um, pretty unique sensations and pretty dynamic sensations using that, such that you can feel objects. Um, and this demo is the one that hooked me. This is the one that I, I picked up this ball and I was playing with it. And since then, I've had a chance to demo this to hundreds of people over the last few years. And this demo amazes me every time I watch somebody do it because they treat the objects like real objects. They don't treat them like virtual objects. They don't treat them, um, they don't close their fists. They keep their fists open and they hold the ball like it's a ball. Um, they hold the cube like they're holding a cube or if they're stacking cubes, they keep their hands as though they're holding, you know, a cubic uh, object in their hand and the, hap the haptics support that uh, wonderfully and then you combine that with interaction engine and some of the great leap motion hand tracking, it all comes together to synthesize into something that feels like a solid object. And so as we start to immerse people in worlds, it's really key to focus on trying to make them feel solid, to make them feel like uh, real things. And so a lot of our demos kind of focused on that. So this is one that, I, that was made before I came to, to Ultra Leap, um, but one that really inspired me. And we would tell people, you know, roll the ball around on the table like a, like a ball of dough. And the second you relate it to like a real world object or stack them like cubes, and they immediately just start treating them like real objects. Um, and the haptics combined with the hand tracking really kind of solidifies that whole environment. So I took this uh, a little bit further with my team and we started looking at different control mechanisms. We had a controls demo that was in two dimensional space showing off our haptics. And I said, well, what else can we do with it? Um, as we start moving, can we move some of this into VR space? And so we just started taking some of our controls and moving into VR space. We had buttons and we had sliders and things and all those are great. 
And we started developing some new ones. And I said, I really, you know, the ball kind of stuck with me. And I said, you know, what else can we do with this? I've, I've used trackballs in the past. I worked as a game developer. We had these cool space orbs that we played with. It was like a, you know, a three axis uh, interface device. And trackball just made more sense to me than like a mouse interface for something like VR space, especially with hand tracking. And so we developed this trackball and it lets you feel the ball in your hand. So you can feel a ball in your hand as you're moving it around. We gave you some visual reference to kind of how the ball is moving. Uh, but the precision is what blew my mind, is that we had a really precise method of controlling a 2D interface. Uh, just like your mouse on your screen, when you move your mouse around, you don't think about, you're not looking at your hand while the hand is moving around on the mouse. And that was kind of the, the goal of this tool, was to be able to create a control mechanism that you didn't have to look at your hand. You can control it very precisely, and you didn't have to look at your hand while you were using it. And so in this demo, you'll see I look up quite a bit. I'm not looking at my hand because I can feel it. I can feel the ball and I can see the result of the cursor, in this case, that little satellite moving around on Mars. And therefore I don't need to look at my hand because I know where the ball is, I know how to move the ball and I can do it very accurately. I added a button to this as well. So you could push down on the Z axis on this actually lets you place flags on Mars. And that was kind of a stretch. That might have been overloading this tool a little bit, but it does work. And I had to work on some mechanisms by which, and you'll see this with some, we just released a new tool today called Touch Free. Um, but as we start to work with uh, different interfaces, what we find is like users, when, they, when, they, when we've established a intent, we know that you want to do something, we can start minimizing some of the other axes, axes and make sure that as you, we've decided that you want to push that button, we can actually start to minimize all of the errata and make sure that as you push that button, that we don't move the cursor too much, that we get the intent that you want and that you get to ex exercise the action that you want. And so there's a fair bit of that happening. And as you see, as I place the flags, you'll see that the cursor kind of stops moving as you get into that zone of actually placing it. And so it's important that, you know, as we go through any kind of interaction design, you're thinking about intent and you're thinking about what they want to do. And if we can determine that, it's really easy to make the controls uh, modify themselves such that they accommodate the intent. Now, getting that wrong is really bad. You really don't ever want to get the intent wrong with, it, with the user because that's frustrating. Right? I didn't mean to click that, or I, you know, I wanted to click that and I didn't. And so it's, it's, it's a fine line and it's a lot of tuning, honestly, to kind of get that just right. Um, but what we found with the, the trackball was once they got a hold of it, we didn't have to teach, you know, I said, here's a trackball. And that's basically all the instruction I would give to somebody who was doing this demo. And they would start rolling the ground and they would see the effect of it immediately. And it was a one-to-one -one with what they would expect. And uh, therefore, there wasn't, it wasn't that different than using a mouse. The, le the learning curve was pretty minor. Um, but again, we're trying to emulate a real world object here. And in doing that, you have to make some modifications because it's midair and because it's um, hand tracking and VR space. But um, for the most part, you're trying, to establish, you're trying to build off of what they already know, if you can. Then immediately after this, we started thinking about uh, multiplayer. Uh, we had seen a lot of hand tracking and Leap Motion had a pretty strong presence and Ultra Leap in, in VR space and in the early days of social VR, I say the early days, but like we're talking about the, the modern era of post 2012 VR space. Um, big screen and alt space were two great examples of products that came out that took advantage of Leap Motion. And if you ever went into one of these worlds, you would see a stark contrast between those people that were using controllers and those people that were using hand tracking. And the ones using hand tracking had these articulations to their hands that were just absolutely magnificent presence establishers, if you will. They, it wasn't the major motions. Like if you look at these videos, you see like the major motions of pointing and thumbs ups and things like this. And those are great. Those are great ways to communicate in VR space, but it was the subtleties that really caught my eye. It was the little finger movements and just how you were holding your hands in various situations or how you used your hands to emote or talk in a very natural way that all of a sudden took these avatars and made them very human, made them very personable and you could recognize that there was somebody behind the scenes. And as we move forward, we have these great capacitive controllers now that are trying to emulate hand tracking your hand positions and things in real time, but they don't do it. I'm telling you, you go into these worlds and you see there's a gap between those that are using capacitive controllers and those that are using hand tracking. And it's not the major motions, again, that really define it. It's the subtleties. It's, it's the nuances of how we hold our hands that really define whether or not there's a person there and how, you can, how that person feels or how that person is reacting. And there's just so much to that that establishes presence that, that we wanted to build on. And so we wanted to do multiplayer. We wanted to take what we had built on and can we do some more multiplayer uh, experiments? And so my team went after this next project, 
well, not this project, but this was this is kind of the start of it. On the Leap Motion side, they were building, you've probably seen uh, some of the demonstrations of the blocks project where you build these cool blocks and you can stack them using a really good um, use case for interaction engine and just close object interactions. Um, we took that and built out our first multiplayer in the office at the time in Palo Alto, now we're in Mountain View. And we started saying, can we get two people in a space to share objects uh, using haptics? At the time, we we're still very haptics. Uh, this demo is very haptics based and we we're trying to make sure that we could have here's an object i'm gonna hold in my hand and i want to hand it to somebody else and maybe they're across the office maybe they're not anywhere near me but i want to hand this object to you and i want you to take it from me and i want you to feel it as i hand it to you and this is what we did and this is what this demo was and this is multi I, this is multiple headsets i'm actually on a vive i think i'm on a vive orig original vive htc and i think my partner in this one uh, engineer i work with was using uh, I think we had it on HoloLens. We were passing all sorts of data over the network. And so networking is really fun to kind of dig into for us. Um, we were passing hand data from one place to another. We were passing SLAM data from like one place to another. In the case of this one, it was HoloLens. SLAM data was being passed one direction. We were hand passing hand data the other direction. Both had hands, both using leap data. And we're passing and we have haptics on both sides. Um, so this was something that we wanted to try to see if we could emulate in a larger multiplayer environment with some activity, but this is really like the first kind of stab at, can we even connect two people and can, can we have a way of like sharing objects that has haptics? Uh, so it kind of, if the first real project we made with it was this thing called Critical Mass and it was for the Augmented World Expo, I think 2018. Um, and we built it as a two player experience and we anchored the two stations kind of back to back. And so that they were in fixed space. In other words, it was one-to-one -one with real space. So if they reached out with their real hand to the other person with real hand, it matched up one-to-one. -one. And we had a lot of people doing high fives and, and handshakes and things as a result of that, and it worked really well. The key was you could see the other person and you could see how they were working. It was a task, -orient it was a task um, uh, completion experimentation. So the two people at this table had to complete a task together. And so they had individual things to do, but then they had to work together occasionally to make this to make this work. Uh, so I have a couple of videos of this. I just want to flip through real quick. Uh, we used a few different mechanisms. One, the hand scan into play. We wanted a hand scan, like a scientific hand scan. So this first thing that you see on the left is really that that hand scan. And at the end of that, we kind of lift up this barrier and you see your partner. So you're kind of by yourself at the beginning of the demo. Um, after you do your hand scan with haptics, uh, with hand tracking, then you get to see your partner and you start and we start presenting you with different controls. We took the controls again from our 2D demos and we started pulling them into VR space. And so some of the buttons and sliders that we had in 2D space, we now pulled into 3D and you could feel the button as you pushed it down, had a click feel to it. The slider, you can feel it on your finger as you pulled it with some you know, uh, you know, know, emulated tension as you kind of pull it left and right. And so you had a really strong variable level of control um, over what you were doing. And these are very powerful controls that we we're showing people. We're asking them to do some pretty complex tasks um, in this game. You had to basically, you were trying to pull specific isotopes into this chamber, and then you had to eventually, of course, it goes critical and you have to solve the problem. Uh, and you do that, of course, with lasers. Um, so I pulled my trackball from the other experiment that I just showed you into this one. I said, okay, let's do a trackball and let's see, can we move it around? and have two people moving these lasers around and they're gonna, with the lasers are gonna pop these isotopes in this bubble. And the whole key was just to show off precision, to show off that two people could work on a task where they're both controlling kind of a mouse-like device, in this case, trackball, using haptics in order to exercise um, the task at hand. And again, just like the trackball on my other demo, we found that uh, people didn't need a lot of coaching. They pretty well just started working with this. And there's video, you can find videos online of Ada Bagui in this, in this experiment. But it was, people took to it really quickly. There was very little instruction necessary for people to understand how to work. And we handed them like four different controls throughout this, the course of this with almost no instruction about how to do it. Because we emulated real world controls, we didn't have a lot of learning curve. And there wasn't a lot of instruction necessary in order the task completion needed instruction, but the actual use of the controls, almost no instruction whatsoever. Hey, Chris, real quick, we had a question come in on that last slide. Um, if uh, what the input device is being used on these three uh, in this trackball laser hand scan, is that uh, attached to a VR headset or is it Leap Motion or Ultra Leap like on a table or camera module? What's being used here? Good question. So, uh, yeah, so we at Ultra Haptics, prior to merging with Ultra Leap, 
we used leap motion devices, leap motion controllers, we call them LMCs internally, uh, attached to our arrays. And our phased array used the hand tracking very accurately to position our focal points and our, our haptic sensations. And for this particular demo, we didn't have leap motions on the headset at all. Uh, they were only on the desktop. And so you had in this particular demo, let me back up one more slide. Um, you can see on the table on the right, we have two arrays. This is uh, what we call them, um, phased array in front of the user that provides a haptic zone that they can interact in and feel sensations within. And the leap motion is attached to that. But you can see on their headsets, the two Vive headsets that they're wearing, they're not, there's no leap motion attached to that. And so when we think about leap motion in VR, we traditionally think of it as something that's head mounted. Um, and in the next demo I'm going to show you, we actually transition to do that. And so um, in this demo, we decided how do we go bigger? I mean, two player was cool, a single haptic zone for each person was cool, but we really felt constrained by only having like one area to interact and, and not being able to kind of move around and have different kind of orientations of the arrays and different configurations of the arrays for haptics. And so we decided to build this massive thing that was 10 by 20. Uh, had a huge metal truss that we had to build. I can't tell you how many times I had to build it and tear it down at different trade shows. Uh, but it was necessary to kind of build out the structure that we wanted. And again, we stuck with fixed space. We wanted two people in the same fixed space. Um, we gave them avatars this time before it was just kind of heads and hands. And now we gave them like full IK avatars. Um, and then we put them in, this, in the shared cave story and kind of Bunch of, we wanted to kind of give you a wide array of different sensations and interactions with, that, with our haptics and with the hand tracking. And so as you go through the space, uh, I'm going to show you some videos in just a second. But this setup used eight different haptic arrays, eight different leap motions, two VR headsets, uh, a bunch of computers all networked together, working seamlessly. Uh, and we took it to probably six different trade shows. Um, and so this is by far the most ambitious kind of giant VR thing that we built out. And it wasn't really designed to be a product. We weren't really trying to sell this to, to a theme park or anything like this. It was more to just show, here's the possibility. Here are the things that you can do with our hand tracking and our haptics. And um, you know, what, what do you want to do with it? This is just, you know, we're not, we're not a game company. We're not a content company, really. We're just creating an experience to show you what's possible. And it was a really great one that ultimately gave me the, the authority just to say, go crazy. And, and we did. We absolutely went crazy on this one. Um, so let me show you some videos real quick and just kind of walk you through a little bit of how this worked. Um, so the first video here on the top left, intro waves and high fives. Uh, this is just kind of, it's really dark, I apologize, because it was kind of a dark world, but you were in VR and so it seemed a little bit brighter at the time. But immediately we show you the other person and we let you do waves. And again, because it's shared space, you could actually reach out and touch the other person, high five, as they do right here. Um, then the first task I give you is uh, I show you with, you know, we show you instructionally with what we call a ghost hand, how to, how to interact with the object. Uh, and this one was just to reach out and trace something. And immediately we're throwing haptics on your fingertips, not just anywhere. We can, and the accuracy is such that we can put a haptic sensation even on a single fingertip. And that's kind of how this, this one worked is that as you touch the platform below you, we apply haptics to wherever you're touching it. And again, really easy for people to pick up. And because we, we did, you know, I think the ghost hands and other things were things that we added in to make sure that it was easy to understand. But once people started drawing, it was, there's no question as to how to do it. Uh, they really understood easily how to trace that shape and complete the task. Um, next up, we gave you a little creature. Original design was to kind of have like a nice little cute big eyed creature with animation, but we honestly didn't have animators. <laughs> so we said, let's go with the ball. The ball's much easier. And a ball, again, back to go back a few demos, I was obsessed with this idea of the ball. So we got the ball back. In this case, we called it a wisp, and it had kind of some behavior to it, and it had some, some different phys physics kind of playing around with it. You could pick it up with one hand or two. The array configuration in this case was two, two of our arrays side by side that kind of created a large interaction array, in which case you could play with this wisp back and forth, pretty much the full extent of your arms. Anywhere you took it, you would have haptics and hand tracking. Um, this setup was really unique in that we, we did have, um, let me go back to just one slide real quick. We did have, there's a leap motion on the front of these headsets and there's also a leap motion on the haptic arrays. And so in this case, we fused the two and we started using both sets of data to determine where your hands are and determine where to apply the haptics um, to the situation. So as you move through the environment to different haptic zones, we're actually transitioning from the hand tracking that you have based on your headset over to the hand tracking 
that's based on the array. And so we found, and there's uh, more recently, you probably see uh, some of you that have worked with leap motion that have seen that there is actually a multi a multi leap uh, SDK out there that you can play with that allows you to put multiple leaps on a single computer. This demo, when we originally made it, did not take advantage of that and actually used a single leap per computer. And so this full setup had eight computers with eight leaps, uh, but it worked great. Um, anyhow, uh, Fire was a good one I just want to talk about briefly. Uh, one of the stations you went to, you had to actually interact with this fire and you put your hands over it and it kind of sweltered up and, and um, over a quarter of the people walking away from this experience said, how did you make my hands heat up? You know, how did my hands get hot? And, you know, inevitably they were like, uh, we didn't. Uh, it's almost impossible to, to raise the temperature using a haptic array on your hands. Um, but it was the sensation, it was the multimodal um, infusion of sound and light and haptics and hand tracking, all kind of like gelling in such a way that your, your brain kind of fills in the blanks and the heat becomes there. You know, your mind believes the heat. And so uh, we saw that with, and it wasn't a small percentage. It was, it was like at least a quarter of the people that went through this demo came away thinking that their hands were heated up by us and they weren't. Uh, at the end of this demo, we ended up with doing a, a, a station that was a two-handed machine. So we, you're basically back at the same place you were playing with the Wisp, but now we've kind of reformed everything. And we've taken those same haptic zones and turned them into this machine that you operate with two hands. With one hand, you're holding over you know, a power of lightning to turn the machine on. And the other one, you actually control different color spheres. And we're applying haptics to the hand, kind of a lightning sensation on one hand. And we're applying, on the other hand, uh, different pulsing sensations based on the color that you're affecting and you're changing the colors in the cave and the task at hand was to kind of create certain colors and you're working together with your partner who has a machine also and the two of you are kind of working together and kind of towards the end of this demo we show you the other partner so you see your the cave kind of opens up and the two of you are working on this machine together and both of you have both hands involved with haptics with hand tracking you can still do high fives and waves and things but you're working together towards kind of a common goal um, and so from all this, uh, we ended up with a few takeaways. And again, most of these were just, uh, I was designing for trade shows. And, and keep in mind that that's not quite the same as designing for home. Uh, somebody that's at their house, you can, you can take a little bit more for granted in terms of their learning curve and saying they're gonna have a little bit more time to, to learn a few new tricks and gestures and other things and come up to speed and become comfortable with how to interact with this uh, application. At a trade show, you don't have that. At a trade show, it's about throughput. You're getting you know, dozens, if not hundreds of people through every day. And you really have to get them up to speed quickly. You have to let them experience as much as they possibly can in a very short amount of time and then get them out of there. And so the learning curves have to be really short. And so we had to be very thoughtful about how do we ramp you up very quickly? How do we get you the experience that you want and get you out as fast as possible? And so the design mechanism is really around train show, trade show mentality. Um, presence, obviously we found that the hand tracking through all this social VR was really critical and we wanted to make sure that that was a key component to some of the interactions that we were creating. Very articulate hands, it was, that was very critical to almost everything that we were doing. Not just for the haptics, that was critical, but it was really more the social side of it, of being in there with somebody and feeling like you're in there with somebody else. Um, the multimodal was massive in terms of just making sure that everything synced up. You wanted the audio matched with the visuals, matched with the haptics, matched with the hand tracking, it all kind of had to come together in order to create the experience that we're going for. Um, again, natural interactions uh, are going to get rid of those learning curves and get you in this experience a lot faster. Um, as you think about your interactions, you know, what is an object that you're interacting with? How would you naturally interact with it? Um, emulate the real world, whether it's a control or an object or anything in the real world. Um, and I think Denny's in his group at the Holonautics, I think that, that hand physics lab was a great example of here are real world objects that we're trying to interact with um, in a real way. And there's no learning curve. You just pick up the object like you would naturally. I think that's a great design tip for, for everybody working in this space. Um, stressors, you want to just think about, especially when, when you're talking about hand tracking, your hands are out there. Um, you're not sitting on your couch with a controller like in your lap, like with a lot of console games. You're out there and your hands are out there. You're not resting on a mouse. And so there's this extra physical element that you really want to take into account as you design and make sure that you're not overstressing people, having them hold their hands up for long periods of time. Um, and so I think that's just a consideration anytime you're doing any kind of hand tracking is just be aware of the, the physical, you know, the physical requirements that you're putting on, on any kind of user. Uh, we had a couple, uh, Han will probably touch on some of this stuff more than, than this, but this picture is from Inglorious Bastards, and it's the German three, and it came up in one of our CS trade shows where we had a demo where we had a lot of gesturing, and one of the gestures was to choose the mode, one, two, three. 
And we learned that there were cultural differences in how people do one, two, three. And we came across some people do it like this in the US, in Germany, it's more like this, and in South America, it's more like this. And so we ended up with, uh, that's three different gestures. When you're doing hand gesture recognition, that's three different things that you have to look for. Uh, so where possible, you know, be aware of those and accommodate for those as best you can because uh, your audience, you have to know your audience well enough to know, you know, how they're going to interact and be accommodating as best you can. Um, and so again, the haptics, to me, that, that was kind of the angle I came to it from. I was a longtime Leap fan, but uh, as I joined this company, I was really focused on the haptic side of things and how to merge all these different media together. Um, and it really, to me, that, that made the world solid. That was, that was like another level beyond just seeing your hands in space and seeing them articulate, being able to feel things in VR space and have those be dynamic and really precise. Um, that's been the fun that I've been you know, lucky enough to have the pleasure to work with over the last few years. Um, and it's really, it's really next level. It's really like uh, you know, pointing towards the future of where we are in you know, these Zoom meetings right now. We're in this ugly 2D space looking at each other's videos. Um, it's where we're headed. And then hoping that we're headed well beyond 2D space into full 3D and you feel like you're in the same room as other people. And I think, you know, that's been one of our largest pushes forward is to see how can we take all this great technology that we have and move into that space and assist that space. So with that, I will uh, hand it over to Hannah. And Hannah, feel free to take over the screen at will. Thank you. Real quick, Chris, while uh, Hannah's getting set up, a uh, quick question I had uh, around text input. So you, you mentioned kind of respecting standards. Uh, and just with regards to like keyboard and text input, what are your thoughts, feelings, inclinations on, you know, gestural input versus physical keyboard type, uh, type of interactions? Uh, we have a few demos uh, that, do t that do keyboards. Um, and we've played with a lot of different keyboards over the years. And uh, prior to the merger, Elite Motion had done quite a bit of work in this space also. Um, Traditional keyboards, uh, there's a precision element to them. Um, there's a very tactile element to them. So if you can get the tactile element back in the equation, uh, it helps a lot. Um, there's projection keyboards out there that use you know, micro projectors, and they lack in that you don't have the tactile feedback of those keys. The mechanic, you know, we're not quite in the mechanical key era anymore. You have to kind of struggle to find a mechanical keyboard anymore. But at least you have some kind of resistive force feeding back on you. Um, so haptics and mid-air haptics can absolutely feed into that. Um, there are some efficiencies we can look to beyond just the natural that I think will assist with those very specific use cases like keyboard input. Um, there's intent we can think about. So there's some predictive things that you can put in place, obviously, to think about what does the user intend to. And anytime you type a Google search, you can get some sense of how many letters you have to type before it really knows what you want. Some of that's based on you and your history and your demographic. Some of that's based on um, just what letter came before and what most likely is predicted to be the next letter. And so I think you can get some cheating through that, swipe keyboards and things like this. Uh, you can absolutely do some of the things John was talking about where you're kind of anticipating uh, the object with like flashlight kind of cone things where you let them be a little bit sloppy, but you're accommodating for that. And you see some of that on the, on the phone keyboards and things as well. Um, and so I think AI and other things feed into this and make that a little bit easier. Um, I really believe that there's another solution out there that, that we're really, we haven't gotten there, that we haven't figured out what, what keyboard input is uh, for this era. And I think uh, it's not a bad idea to start from what we know, but I think there's there's a lot of headroom to figure out how to do it better. So right there, dude. Love it, thanks for that. Think, uh, appreciate the actual little insights. Hannah, ready to go, rock and roll, let's do this. Thank you. Hi, yeah. Hi, so yeah, my name's Hannah Limerick and I'm a user researcher at UltraLeap. Uh, yeah, and I've been at Ultraleap for about three years, um, just a little over three years. So, yeah, I've done plenty of user testing and usability testing uh, on various different products using both haptics and, uh, and the hand tracking. So, so what I'm going to talk about today is a bit more of the kind of design side, I guess the UX design side where we're thinking about what are the sort of aims of the experience and how do we um, essentially reach the, the sort of goal that we want to with the experience. So I'm going to talk about usability testing. So I hope most people who here have tried a bit of usability testing um, or are willing to try a bit of usability testing um, because there's some really good benefits to that. So the, the key one really is that you get to uncover usability issues early. Um, so that saves a lot of um, development work and design work, um, getting 
you know, down the line and realizing, oh, actually, there's a bit of a usability issue here. So that's what people do when designing interactive experiences in general. But with XR, it's particularly important because for a lot of users, this is the first time they would have been in um, a virtual experience. So a lot of things aren't going to come naturally. Um, there may be things that are um, confusing in the world that we want to understand early and, and sort of refine our designs based on that. So yeah, the key thing really is to understand what's intuitive to users. Uh, and then, yeah, refine your designs based on that evidence. So I wanted to give a few tips on what makes a good usability testing session. Uh, so I'd say you need to test with your target audience. Um, you can usually get most of the usability insights with uh, between five to eight participants. So it doesn't need to be loads of people, just five to eight participants. Um, if you can, have a facilitator and an observer. Um, the facilitator is the person who talks the participant through the session. And the observer is the person who, yeah, is basically taking notes and picking things up that maybe the facilitator isn't picking up because they're, you know, talking the user through the, the testing session. Um, try and keep it planned and scripted. So if you plan the session and you have a script, it means that you are asking all the participants the same questions and getting them to do the same tasks, which means that, yeah, you've got some comparable um, insights there. Try not to ask leading questions as well. Um, and really encourage participants to think out loud. So what that means is uh, getting participants to talk you through what they're expecting to do. Well, why are they doing what they are doing and what um, is not clear to them? And through that, um, you can usually pull out a lot of the uh, problems or usability issues that may come up in the experience. So what I'll do is talk about a project that we worked on and we applied usability te session testing and basically we can kind of see where what we actually did to the design based off that so the experience um, that I'm using as an example is a short um, experience uh, designed for CES uh, the consumer electronics show earlier this year and the aim of the experience was to uh, demonstrate hand tracking and haptic technology uh, and it was kind of like a vision of the future where um, we may be in autonomous vehicles and we've got extra free time and we may want to use that time in VR doing sort of more productivity based tasks. So the key thing about a trade show which Chris mentioned earlier is that yes it needs to be a fairly quick experience um, probably about four to five minutes long. Um, we want to showcase the technology, but importantly, it's a range of different um, backgrounds. So some people may never have used um, VR. So we wanted to have a quite a low um, barrier to entry for this particular experience. So the interaction design was based off two kind of key principles. Um, so one was kind of grabbing an orb and placing it in the space and that became a panel as you can see on the right hand sides here it became a panel and then you could interact with this panel so yeah a bit of a mix of things that people have probably done before the panel is very much like a website style um, interactive experience but fairly unfamiliar in terms of like grabbing something out of a hand menu for example so yeah, we wanted to learn a bit more about this through usability testing. So we did our first round and really what we wanted to understand here was what is intuitive to people. So the task we asked people to do was a very simple task. Um, we essentially asked people to put the headset on, go into the experience and talk us through what they're seeing and why they're doing what they're doing and just explore the virtual world and kind of think out loud to us. So the reason we did that was really just to understand what people were naturally doing in the experience. So the findings, um, 
from the first round. We found a lot of things, but I just wanted to keep a kind of a sort of concise example. So we're going to talk about intuitiveness and kind of low, lowering the barrier of entry. Um, so we found that, yeah, participants were tapping and scrolling through the panel content like they would a mobile phone touchscreen, which, yeah, makes a lot of sense. Um, this is what people are used to, and they were using kind of index finger to, to move around the, the content. But also what we were finding was that people were also tapping and pressing the orbs. Um, and it wasn't obvious to people that they needed to kind of grab them and place them in the environment. We also found a tendency for people to interact with just one hand. So we, we took these findings and turned them into some recommendations. So one of the recommendations was, okay, yes, everyone's uh, wanting to instinctively tap and scroll these panels. So that's great. Let's stick to that. That helps with this kind of low, lowering the barrier of entry. However, we also did want to encourage some kind of new types of interactions and really showcase what you can do with hand tracking and, you know, taking menu items and placing them in your environment um, is, yeah, a, a nice new thing you can do with hand tracking. So one of the recommendations was to, to introduce this kind of pinch grab uh, pose early on in the experience to aid that awareness and kind of plant that seed that, yes, you can do this action. We also wanted to provide um, the opportunity for users to actually practice this um, early on in the experience. And we also yeah, needed to encourage this kind of two-handed interaction. So what you can see in the bottom right hand corner here is our first version of um, the entry scene. So this is what you see kind of as soon as you put the headset on. And what you just do is you put your hand into this um, outline and then it goes into the virtual world. And then um, I think you should be able to see that the index finger ends, the thumb are lit up there as well. So. Um, that was what we did to encourage people to do the pinch but actually what we realized was we needed to do a bit more than that um, that was quite good at reinforcing the idea of a pinch but it wasn't really enough for a lot of people so so yeah those are our recommendations so what we did was refine the experience um, so we had this hand orientation screen at the beginning where we actually got people to place two hands into um, these hand outlines um, and do quite a sort of very exaggerated uh, sort of pinch gesture to start the experience. And that really sowed the seeds that, okay, this is an action here that you, you can do in this world. Um, we also use instructional text. Then um, we also introduced Kind of like a short just scrolling through to actually go into the experience so it was just a pinch and drag the orb and that took people into the experience so that was an opportunity for people to to practice uh, doing that now i would say that um getting people to actually actively go into the virtual world so by doing an action is a really good tip um if you just put the headset on and they're just immediately in this world um could be a bit, a little bit um, strange for people. So actually, getting people to take themselves into that world uh, is really nice in terms of giving people that feeling of agency that I've stepped into this world. Uh, also, with it being in the sort of black background, it means that people can really focus in on that task um, rather than you know, there's a lot going on once you're in the virtual world. So yeah, these were the refinements. So then we wanted to put it through a second round and see whether these have changed um, the usability. So yeah, we did a second round. And yeah, what we found was, yeah, this hand outline made uh, users familiar and it sowed the seeds that, okay, you can do this hand pose. Uh, and this is something that's possible in this world. The, the slider sort of pinch slider to move and move into the experience appeared to be effective because we observed people um, being able to do the pinch with a lot more ease um, throughout the rest of the experience, which really allowed them to access all the features available uh, in the experience. So the issue with the scenario where the person doesn't discover that they can do a pinch gesture and, and sort of move orbs around was that a lot of our features were kind of 
behind that. So you needed to know that in order to do things like what you can do in this bottom right hand corner GIF where um, they're like customizing uh, a bag, um, taking the orbs out. So it was great to see that people were able to explore the world and, and see more that was available through the hand tracking. And yeah, we did find that people did have some minor difficulty with that first slider. Um, it was one of those things where, okay, we, we wanted to like surface up that difficulty uh, and then they would be able to kind of interact with more ease throughout the rest of the experience and that they weren't having that difficulty or confusion further down the line. So yeah, so it was good. Um, and we, we had a good experience where people had fairly low barrier to entry and could get through the experience quite quickly. And, and like I said, that was really the aim of uh, the demo, but also, yeah, to show the what hand tracking can do and how you can kind of have more of a spatial um, interaction. So yeah, the key takeaways uh, from this one example, we do loads of usability testing and, you know, I could give loads of examples, but I want to keep it kind of short and concise here. So um, really is to, to test with users early uh, and then cover what people naturally do um, and what they naturally struggle with. Uh, refine and, and test again and repeat that as many times as you feasibly can in your experience design process. And also doing this also helps us to kind of build up these standards that will start to emerge um, the more VR becomes um, prevalent. So I think the more we're doing these things and, and learning and, and documenting what we're learning um, will help to sort of add to design guidelines. So yeah, trying to introduce completely brand new interactions like say the pinch gesture um, fairly early on. And, and try not to introduce too many of the new interactions in one experience. I think, you know, using some of these more um, kind of obvious interactions, so a panel, yes, an index finger, a button, yes, you push that. Trying to kind of rely on those physical interactions makes a lot of sense, but there are things that you can do that um, go over and above that, and you can introduce new things like moving things around in space which may not be that obvious to people. So don't add loads of new things because people probably won't discover them. So yeah, that's my, my, my question. Yeah, this, is so, this is so great. And uh, you might not be seeing this, but there've been a lot of great questions uh, coming in that Jonathan and Chris have been answering kind of in the Q and A section. Uh, one of the open ones right now, uh, two, two specifically, uh, what is meant by no leading questions when you're, when you're working with your testers? Yeah, that's a good, um, good question. So for example, uh, if I was to say, did you like that experience? That's a leading question. Um, the, the way you should ask the question was, how did you find that? So it's nice and open-ended. Very nice. I can now see how in my own life I might be able to do that more in my conversations, <laughs> just uh, personally, right? Yeah. Um, another good question coming in. Um, how do you make testers feel comfortable uh, during uh, testing a VR game if they're new to the medium? Um, yeah, that's a really good question as well. So. For a lot of people that we see, that it is their first time in VR. Um, so they are, you know, going into this strange new world, I guess. Um, and usually it's letting them put their own headset on, for example, um, and kind of, you know, sorting it out themselves, but just being there if they need that help. Um, and yeah, usually making the first task that you ask people to do very kind of easy and just letting them kind of explore the space um don't go in feeling, really difficult. not feeling rushed yeah taking it at their own pace kind of exactly yeah and also you have a sort of script at the beginning where you would kind of try and put people at ease have a bit of a chat with them at the beginning of the session so they are really at ease not that they've walked through the door and all of a sudden they've got a headset on and they're in virtual right. reality so yeah it's kind of easing people in um one question uh we have from andre and this is similar to a question I'd had as well, kind of uh, tips on testing over distance, especially now, like when some folks are in quarantine and kind of um, 
when you do usability testing, are you trying to test in their native kind of natural environment, or do you have them come to a closed, controlled environment like at the office? What's your uh, what's your approach for that? So yeah, in general, I think the ideal is to do a bit of both. So um, yeah, with this sort of early usability testing at the, at the early stage where you're looking at prototypes, I think yeah, bring people into the office, and, and that's what we do a lot. Um, we were at the point um, last year where we were doing it once a month. Um, but obviously, if you're developing something that's very much about the environment, um, so we're actually also looking at um, kind of touchless interfaces, so replacing touchscreens in public spaces. And that's really very much about the environment, so being in the public space. So right. that is really the best learning is really doing it in the, that space in that environment um also maybe if you're doing something in a vr arcade um and you, you want to learn about how people in vr arcades uh behave i think it's best doing it in that space so it's yeah just getting a balance i think um and remote well remote is tough i, I think that's the we've done some remote testing where we've kind of asked people to do gestures towards um, the camera, so giving people like a task and then asking them, okay, how would you do this particular task and getting them to um, do the gesture towards the camera, but it is kind of limited. Um, with VR, I haven't actually done any kind of remote VR testing at the moment, but yeah, you just need to make sure they've got the um, the headset. We have done some haptics uh, remote testing actually, and yeah, it's via Zoom and it's a little bit more difficult, but if you're collecting more like quantitative data, it's easy because you get the person to do the task and then you've got the data, they'll just send you over the Excel um, file. But if it's observational, that is a challenge remote. Yeah, definitely way more, uh, I guess, observational challenges in doing remote versus you being there. So some, some kind of like balance there, that, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, Susan, good friend at AWE in LA, just wanted to give you a quick shout out. Uh, she said, thank you for the thoughtful onboarding examples that you shared, Hannah. Um, and then last question here is, as I understand, most of the tests are done while testers were seated. Uh, how would it be effective for applications in which users might be standing? Um, I guess in terms of effectiveness, accuracy, or even fatigue, what are some findings you've seen from seated versus standing um, examples? So in terms of, it depends on the, the demo itself and where it's intended. So with the, the car example, see, yes, it was a seated experience. So um, that's why we, we tested with uh, seated experiences. But we do have um, VR experiences where people stand. Um, and yeah, even ones where people walk around, like some of the ones that uh, Chris uh, talked about earlier. And yeah, I think in terms of doing a task in VR, moving your hand around, as long as the experience isn't really, really long, people don't seem to get fatigues um, from my experience, you know, but we generally do kind of demos where it's for a trade show, for example. So, you know, that is a question mark is, you know, in the future, maybe if you're in VR all the time, what happens ergonomically? Um, there'll have to be more research into that. And there is plenty of academic research, but from, from what I've done, I haven't really explored that, you know, specifically. Very cool. No, thank you everyone for the questions. Um, thank you to our speakers. Uh, this has been really insightful. Like I've been a big fan of, of your team's work for some time and being able to get this kind of in-depth, you know, look into use cases uh, usability testing, looking more at uh, some of the demos that your team has uh, has put together and the thoughts that you've put behind, uh, just making it as helpful and useful for people. Um, we have, let's see, okay, so real quick, I'm going to introduce uh, Ferhan. So he's the co-founder of XTAR Bootcamp, and he, he's been a great part of kind of helping bring together these relationships between, uh, between VR ARA, between XR Bootcamp, with UltraLeap, um, and, and other partners like Dennis and Roger at Holonautic uh, and our good friends at SideQuest. So uh, th that's a real quick introduction to Farhan, and he's going to share some more information uh, for our participants here. You Hi got everyone. it, Farhan. 
Thank you. Thank you, Joe. I mean, I'm really um, enjoying the conversation and uh, there are many questions coming. Last time we had uh, actually uh, over 20 questions and we are, uh, Joe um, and me, uh, try to deliver this to Tom, but uh, we didn't have enough time. So maybe some of them that we can deliver today. I think we have uh, 15 minutes that we can continue the conversation if it's okay for everyone uh, to make sure that we answer some of them. But first of all, we have actually the uh, Dennis and Rogers masterclass alumni here with us and some of the mentors of XR Bootcamp here, like Ian, uh, Jonathan, uh, Susan uh, here, and Mark is also our mentors. So um, I will leave the stage to them if they have personal questions that they can ask now one-to-one, uh, -one, or we can take the Q&A um, questions one by one. Uh, Ratko is here as well. Maybe Ratko, would you like to ask? Uh, Ratko is one of the key influencers on hand tracking. I don't know if you follow his uh, Twitter, but he has really interesting experiments and um, uh, uh, plugins that he's um, sharing with the community. Hi, Ratko. Would you like to ask? Sorry, Where I was mute. Uh, yeah, actually, last time I had a question for Tom. Last time I worked with uh, the haptics array from Ultra Haptics was maybe five years ago or something like this. And um, I was actually curious how how much progress have you guys made on modeling different behaviors? I think, Chris, you were talking a little bit about this, but at the time there was only something like waterfall and a couple of basic sort of feelings. How close can you actually get to simulating a ball or something like this that you were actually talking about? Yeah, I mean, I'll leave it there. It's, it's definitely still a work in progress. Uh, it's not perfect, but I think we're doing it pretty well right now. So um, what we found is, you know, we, balls and cubes, easy. We can get that without trying. Um, but it's, you get into like concavities, like a Stanford bunny or like a teapot kind of situation. And we start to run into some issues with just the fine points and seeing like those really, if, if you put a blindfold on somebody and said, you know, what shape is it? And you give them a really complex shape. Some of the finer details are harder to get at right now. It's not to say that we're not going after it very hard right now. And that we're, not, we're not making progress in that space. But those are the, those are the challenges. It's trying to figure out how to determine what's important. Um, and so you look at a shape and it's not just saying, okay, just make sure that every single vertice is something that we, we apply haptics to, because that's not necessarily what's important to the user. Because between the object and the user, there's perception. And the perception is really what we're after in terms of you thinking that you're touching a teapot and making sure that that's what you perceive. And so a lot of our research focuses on that, that mentality of not trying to necessarily create one-to-one, -one, but to try to create the perception of one-to-one -one as best we can using our haptics. But yeah, to your point, uh, it's, there's room on the road for us to, to travel before <laughs> we kind of get to every possible uh, object out there. Okay, but you can get actually sharp, sharp corners now or some yeah, I mean, that, that example I showed the cube, it was, you could ask anyone, you know, blindfolded, you know, are you touching a cube or a sphere? And, you know, those, those really obvious kind of differentiators um, are, are pretty well received. It's, it's when you get into a lot of subtleties that you start to run into gray area. And that's, that's where a lot of our research is focused right now. Yeah, I think it's also um, just realizing that it is mid-air haptics. So, um, replicating a real world object um, maybe isn't the kind of right thing to be thinking about it in that way. So um, thinking about what is the purpose of adding um, the sense of touch. So that may be to confirm that you have touched a thing. So it's about the presence of um, confirming that you've touched the object. Um, and also um, we are looking at things like icons through the haptics. So it's kind of how can you like send semantic information through um, that sense? So sometimes you don't necessarily need to replicate the object, um, but you can add the idea that that object is there. Um, and also, I, I, the thing I really like about the haptics is that you can kind of create experiences that you never could feel in the first place. 
So um, we've got a lot of experiences where you, you kind of feel magic and you can add to immersive experiences. Um, you can have superpowers. Um, you can like buy things out of your hands. Um, so that's kind of where the haptics, I think, add to that, that um, immersiveness of the experience. Thanks a lot. And thanks a lot for the awesome talk, guys. I really enjoyed it. Great. Nice to see you, Ratko, again. Um, we have a few more questions, maybe quickly. Joe, you can help us to... Yeah, one... Questions very quickly. Great. Yeah, one just came in, Hannah, that kind of touches on that magical kind of fantastic uh, aspect of hand representation. Uh, one question is, what are your thoughts on different hand representations, meaning reduced fingers, like hands with four fingers, like sometimes in movies you see this on... Uh, like non-human species, for example, um, fusing or amplifying motions. Is it okay to change the representation a lot or what are, uh, or does that feel too weird to users? If there's been any, any so thoughts on that? There's loads of um, like academic research to show that our sort of sense of bodily representation is really loose. So you can actually make people feel some feeling of ownership over bodies that are really different to your own. Um, and people actually use it to kind of create empathy um, for other types of um, people um, or to um, sort of help with kind of phobias and interesting kind of therapy things. So, yeah, I think that, you know, using different representations of hands is a really interesting thing. And um, yeah, it would be really, really cool, I think. And, and people, I think, would really feel that embodiment. There's plenty of research to show that. Cool, thank you, Hannah. Let's see, what else, Farhan? Um, we can, maybe I can have one question from the previous week, because this is actually something that I'm also curious about. Um, so uh, the, the question is, uh, of course, to Tom, but uh, I'm sure that you can also uh, give us some uh, idea about that. Um, do you think it is possible to integrate ultrasound haptics into an H HMD module that is lower power enough to work on a standalone device? I don't know who wants to feel that. <laughs> I'll jump on <laughs> that. Um, so I think Tom mentioned last week, uh, yeah, we've done all sorts of fun and crazy experiments in the office. Um, namely, yeah, we have put him, we put, giant arrays on our, on our headsets before. It does work, it works actually pretty well. Um, power is definitely one of the considerations. And as we start to think about um, mobile headsets, that's more challenging. Um, wired, we could probably reasonably put something together that's wired. I think there's, there's also some ergonomic and weight issues and other things you wanna consider. Uh, but it's on our minds. It's something that we think is pretty cool to think about and we've definitely experimented a fair bit with it. Um, but yeah, I think it comes down to those kind of physical constraints that we're working on, which is like things like power consumption and weight and size. And um, obviously we're working on all those things. And I think once everything lines up, I think that becomes feasible down the road, absolutely. Perfect, perfect. Um, one thing that I would like to also mention for those, some of those maybe missed the first part of the class, we are, uh, especially for these classes, we are trying to make it as intimate as possible. So um, uh, we will share the uh, private link on our Discord channel that is being shared on, uh, on the chat. So uh, for those who missed the first part can also watch that. Uh, one more question. This is also for me. Uh, I'm also curious. Um, will there be a mobile Android iOS SDK for fast prototyping and demonstrations? Or uh, let me add one more question. Can it be an app that we can actually uh, utilize for first mobile AR and then headset-based AR? No one's jumping on this one either, so I guess I will. <laughs> All right, John probably knows something about this as well. But um, I apologize. Could you re repeat that question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, the question is: Will there be a mobile Android iOS SDK for fast prototyping and demonstrations? There may be an Android SDK uh, as we uh, evolve our relationship with Qualcomm and build out uh, 
you know, essentially the Qualcomm Reference Design and Developer Kit. Uh, we'll be bringing our Unity modules, which is our Unity SDK that interacts with our tracking pipeline, over to Android, and uh, and essentially allowing for that whole thing. iOS is, uh, I can't say. Okay. Yeah, so okay, historically, great. Leap Motion has put out SDKs in the past, alpha SDKs on the Android platform. Um, that platform is definitely at the forefront of our mind. It's, it's been requested heavily. Um, and it's, it's on the roadmap. I think Tom mentioned that last week. Um, right now, I think there's been a lot of questions about the, about the Qualcomm HMD and the reference design and our support of optimizing on that chipset. And so I think that was that was the harder lift for us was was making sure that we could operate um, on this great new chipset from Qualcomm. Uh, the platform is is coming. I, mean, I think the platforms that people want are, are definitely lined up in our in our road in coming. Great. Uh, one last question from last week: um, Is Ultra Leap moving fully towards hand tracking based on a cameras at head height? Or does the software work with a camera array on a desk pointed upwards? So we're building out tracking pipelines right now that uh, support both head mounted mode and desktop mode and a soon to be announced uh, third mode that uh, you'll find out about once uh, V5 launches. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, we're, we're refreshing all of our uh, hand tracking orientations uh, for the new release. Perfect, perfect. I think your partnership with Qualcomm will democratize for, for uh, most of the headset manufacturers different form factors. So we are looking forward to seeing the next update. And um, maybe um, we also discuss right now with, uh, with Ultra, Ultra Leap team to find a way to add Ultra Leap new device hand tracking capabilities to our master class. I know, uh, Roger, Dennis, uh, do you have anything that you would like to add to that? Or um, I can also use the time for a few more questions. Uh, yes, that's something we always wanted to do is to look deeper into the Leap Motion SDK and also have maybe half a week introduction part on how to set up. Uh, up to now, we only have the explanation how to set up a project in Unity. Uh, for hand tracking using the Oculus SDK, but adding it for the uh, Ultra Leap SDK would also be something we plan. Yeah, especially because the most of the framework is actually device agnostic. We just use the information of the hands, but many of the other parts, part of the pinch gesture, which um, will be there also in the other SDK. Um, the rest of the parts don't use any Oculus specific interactions that it's basically working for any system which uses hand tracking. Um, but I actually have one question, which is very interesting to me for, um, so first of all, thank you very much. I mean, the, your examples, um, especially the GIFs, et cetera, I really love how the visual part is also there, not just the functional part, and it really illustrates the different points. I love that. And because we are very interested in also networking and the social part, we're wondering, does the Leap Motion SDK already have um, you know, a compression because everything about networking is all about compression and getting the input as small as possible to send over the network. Is there already a compression there for the hand poses to be sent over the network to not use too much bandwidth that you can have multiple people basically in a network environment? Yes, actually there is. So in the, uh, in the core assets as part of the Unity SDK, uh, okay. we wrote a special, um, you know, lead motion hand tracking frame to byte uh, transformation. Yeah. Uh, I believe it compresses a full two hand frame into 168 bytes. Uh, and this is compressing the position, the quaternion orientation, and all of the joints in the hand. Uh, and then it also includes um, uh, compressed representation to compressed representation interpolation so that your hands, you know, aren't, uh, you know, they don't look like they're coming in at the network frame rate, they're coming in at you know, the full application frame rate. Uh, so that is, let me see if I can actually just find a link to that that script within our, our SDK, and I'll put it in the public chat. Oh, that's actually fantastic news because yeah, we, we will also add that to the Discord channel with as well. The Oculus SDK, but yeah, that's very good to know. I mean, uh, we are always finding ways to improve our trainers. Don't stop always experimenting. So um, this network part that we are still asking to our uh, advisory board industry 
and of course the game entertainment industry. Um, let's see how will it work out. But Ian, uh, I think you have one question. Uh, he is also uh, one of our uh, graduates from the last um, advanced interaction design class. He he enjoyed at least on the Oculus Quest part. So how did you find Ultraleap's recent improvements? And what we would like to hear your question as well. Uh, yeah, hi. Thanks so much for uh, giving the talk and the presentation today. Um, I mean, uh, I guess uh, I have tried this device briefly at a, at a conference, but it was just to the point of being able to feel like a waterfall pass over your hand. It was kind of new information today that you can um, do the setup where you have different um, sensor arrays set up on scaffolding to be able to, to create sensations out in open space. So one of the things that I'm actually curious about is the uh, the table tennis demo that was done previously for the North Star headset, because that was one of the most standout uh, experiences that I, I, I've seen in augmented reality, really. And so um, part of my question is, is, do you have any intentions of incorporating a device like the ultra haptic device into an experience like that of like uh, especially talking about the um the ball cursor i could imagine walking up to a table being able to interact uh across this this 2d surface and whatnot w what if do, do you see any future uh in working either in augmented reality or virtual reality of like walking up to a table to play a sport kind of like table tennis in that demo or do you have any future demos maybe that you can talk about, maybe not, that uh, are going in the direction of augmented reality. I just, I thought that the table demo, table, table tennis demo was incredible. I'm happy to hear that you think that. Uh, I built that demo in like the basement of our, uh, uh, of one of our old offices, uh, trying to hide it from all the managers until it was done because, uh, you know, they were wondering, you know, why are you taking our $40,000 OptiTrack system and you know, why are you hoarding the ping pong table? We want to play ping pong. And uh, why are you setting up, you know, a giant computing system uh, next to our ping pong table? Gosh, dang it. Uh, but uh, I'm glad you like it. Um, setting up an ultra haptic system for the ping pong demo. Uh, it's an interesting idea. Uh, there, the thing is, I mean, what parts would you, would you want to use haptics for? Would you use your hand as a paddle and, uh, and slap the ball or like, uh, where would you see haptics incorporating into an experience like that? Well, possibly. I don't think that the uh, necessarily the name of the game doesn't need to be ping pong. I could also see like if there was if you were to walk up to some sort of gaming table as um, people like Dungeons and Dragons fans may have. If you were to walk up to a gaming table and you start to place props or strategize across this table, if there's feedback on the board or like um, I don't know if if it, if if you're looking at a table and it displays this landscape in uh, augmented reality or virtual reality um, and a geyser or a volcano erupts and you can feel that kind of sensation across the table. Do you think that that would be a compelling experience for users enough that it's something that you'd be interested in looking into? I'll let Chris answer that one. Uh, yeah, we, you know, a lot of the trade shows we go to, we've been really interested in LVE or location-based entertainment space, which is arcades, theme parks, you name it. And this is kind of where I feel like that, that has the best role. Not so much, I mean, the home is just, it's, it's big, cumbersome and expensive and probably not for the average consumer to buy. Um, but you should, if you want to, please buy it. Uh, but it, it's more, it's larger scale. I think, you know, COVID has kind of made a lot of these environments slow down a little bit this year. Obviously people, Disney and other people are still having trouble kind of getting um, up to numbers again. That, that's gonna probably, be solved. Uh, and we still feel that space long term is really compelling to us. Um, we feel like the haptics in the map, like especially when you talk about like Disney or Universal, any of these major theme parks and the magic that you feel like when you go to those places, is, it's experiences you can't get anywhere else. That it really is something in, in having magical experience of not having anything on your hands and feeling something. I mean, I'll tell you just from every trade show I go to where we get, you get that first time or the person that's never touched our haptics before. And they, you'll see, we have videos of it, just like that expression. It's like that magical expression of, they don't know what just happened, but it was really cool. And, you know, we think that that's a great environment for it. So whether you're talking about volcanoes or, or whatever, uh, Leap Motion's found its way into quite a few of those spaces already. Um, and so we have the Leap hand tracking going throughout, you know, Legoland has it in the Ninjago ride. 
Um, we've seen it in, in quite a few other places as well. Obviously, a lot of the arcades like the Void and other places are using hand tracking. We think that all those are great environments to, to, to think about adding haptics to, um, especially because of hygiene and other things. You don't want to be touching you know, everything in the environment. And so mid-air haptics is perfect for all of that. Joe, you were at uh, Void. I think you know these days. You mentioned uh, last time as well. So it's perfectly fitting. Yeah, you know, I sure hope. Okay, 2020 has been pretty sucky for so many things, but uh, especially hard on location-based kind of entertainment spaces. But uh, yeah, at the time, I mean, we were in discussions and just talking with, uh, with Tom and the team at, at what was Ultra Haptics at the time about using haptic experiences uh, to like, you know, literally like walk through a portal or to have this sensation where the sensor arrays are placed around your body in a way that makes it feel like you're being you know, transported up like a, a beam of light, you know, type of thing. So uh, there's really, I think, a lot of cool entertainment uh, applications for this. But on a very practical level, every time at a, I'm at a gas station and I have to press physical buttons, I'm like, ultra haptics, guys, like gas mm -hmm. stations. <laughs> Might not be on your radar, but, uh, you know, uh, I, I would be there for it. Uh, yeah, so we've been pushing, this year especially because of COVID and other things, we've been pivoting a little bit towards touchless interfaces. So this is every kiosk on the planet, from menu boards to informational kiosks to wayfinding. Um, you know, wherever you go, you're touching screens, ATMs. We, we can solve all those problems. I mean, hand tracking, you know, we have interfaces. We just literally today released a product called TouchFree that is, you can get off our website that, um, that allows you to map it onto your existing interface. It's a retrofit solution. That, Basically, we put as long as you have a leap motion device, you can put this solution on any screen you have and turn it into a touch screen versus a mouse, or, or put it into a touch free screen versus a touch screen. Um, so yeah, we pivoted quite a bit towards that. Um, it's not as fun as the embarks, but um, it's still uh, people need it this year especially, and so we found that that was actually a pretty good. Yeah, activity. definitely. Yeah, yeah okay. I'll be. Um, I'm going to throw that touch free just like there's a lot of cool news about that just today, right? A few hours ago. So I'll, I'll throw a, a quick like PR um, link up in the chat as well for anyone to check out. So let's also make sure that we share that on our Discord community. Perfect. So I think it's time to uh, wrap up a little bit. Do you, does any of you have one last question? Maybe we can have one, two minutes to answer that. Uh, have we, have we covered all the questions? Um, oh, yeah, I think so. So uh, on the Q and A part. So if anyone has last question, we can take. If not, it's already uh, almost one hour forty minutes. So I would like to uh, give the stage to Joe to uh, wrap up. And uh, I would like to thank to everyone here for this uh, inspiring talk. I hope that we can find a way to integrate Ultra Leap to our classes. So more, more I mean, Leap Motion is there anyways for many, many years. We, as a, when we are building labs in different cities, we were always distributing these Leap Motion devices to make sure that they have hand tracking enabled. So hand tracking is not a new thing, thanks to Leap Motion um, and now Ultra Leap. So uh, thank you for, for your time and for this amazing talks. We will share the link with, um, with the Discord group and um, hope to see you in the next class. Joe, any, anything you would like to add? Uh, last thing, just thanks again. Um, we, we started this session, I think, with about 130, 140 uh, participants. And we still have 102 online. So thanks for sticking with us. Uh, this was just a really great kind of informational uh, deep dive, you know, into the Ultra Leap uh, technologies. And this was uh, really great to hear. Um, I guess as like a parting thing, one quick reminder that uh, our Masterclass Next cohort for XR Bootcamp is starting soon. Um, the deadline for registration is October 12th that we're shooting for. Uh, we do have uh, that promo code for any attendees here at this webinar. It is webinar 10. Uh, with a capital W, um, and if anyone can throw in the in the chat real quick, just the XR Bootcamp website link for those that are more curious to learn about the curriculum. But 
really, um, after this, uh, after all of our kind of events and webinars, we like to have a Discord after party uh, in our Discord server. So uh, come hang out with us. Come chat. Um, feel free to ask more questions about Ultra Haptics, about the master class, about what else kind of uh, the XR creator community is up to. A uh, great opportunity to network, uh, get to meet other designers, developers, re researchers, students. Um, we love developers, and uh, we like making new stuff. You know, we recognize that um, this is a really challenging industry for so many reasons, but that these constraints really do inspire creativity across so many levels. And it's amazing to see what the Ultra, Ultra Leap team has been able to do with these types of constraints. And uh, you, the developers and designers, really inspire us uh, with what you're doing. So please come join us in the D XR Creators Discord server. And uh, yeah, thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.